I just thank the Lord for our beautiful church and all that God is doing. As I was saying to you, speaking to this pastor in Sri Lanka, in a place called Bata Kulai, Kulai, they don't even have a church. Because what happened is, when these children were killed in that church, nobody wants to go back to that building. And they are now just all over the place. But how we thank God that we could meet together in this beautiful, beautiful edifice to give glory and honor to Jesus. We give him thanks for that. <laughs> Do you know, as I said to you last week, the fastest growing church is in Iran. And they are all meeting in house churches. They are all getting baptized in secret. There's a move going on in the world that you and I don't even have the simplest idea of. Do you know that there are many dreams and many visions that are being seen throughout the Muslim world and people are coming to know Jesus by their thousands. Hallelujah. We give glory and honor to God for his faithful. This morning I want to read to you from the book of John chapter 4, reading some verses. And uh, the title of my message is so simple, The Woman at the Well. And you all know the story. I you as uh, old as many that are here, you know the song. She went to the water. She went to the, uh, what, the well that did not have any water. You remember that song? She went away singing. She came back bringing others to the water that was not in the well. Now, those of you that understand the story, I want to bring to you some truths, some revelatory truths that the Lord showed me that are truly amazing. And I know that you will be blessed. Reading from John chapter 4 verse 1. John chapter 4 verse 1. I'd love to encourage you to, to bre please bring your Bibles to church. I don't think you'll see many churches where the pastor will stand with the Bible in his hand. Rather they have the laptops. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with iPads. Nothing wrong. But we need to get back to the word of God. We need to have a physical Bible where we scratch and scrape and write and whatever. So. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again unto, into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar. Um, this city is also known, known as Shechem. If you go to Israel today, you'll find the city of Shechem. It's a beautiful little city. Near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So it was 12 o'clock. And Jesus was tired. Now, when I say Jesus is tired, one or two of you might ask, but how can the Son of God be tired? Remember that he was man and he was God. As a man, he was tired, he was thirsty, he was hungry. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. I want you to note that she came alone. I want you to note the hour that she came. Normally, women of Samaria would come together in groups because there was terrible dissension between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so they would come in groups either in the morning or in the uh, e evening. But this lady came at the noon hour. She came at 12 o'clock when nobody comes to drink water or to draw water from the well. And I will explain that later. And Jesus says to her, give me to drink. You see, for one, the Samaritans had no dealings with the Jews. Secondly, a Jewish man will never speak to a woman and leave it, you know, not just a woman, but a Samaritan woman. And here we have Jesus, a Jew, saying to a Samaritan woman, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat, so he was alone at the well. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me? which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. You see, any water that's running is living water. Any water that's in a well is dead water. 
And Jesus is saying unto her, in the physical, I will give you living water, running water, and she's assuming that there's a river or a lake close by that's moving, and Jesus will be able to draw and give her that water. The woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with you. See, she's looking for a river. And the well is deep from whence then hast thou that living water. Where are you going to get the water from? And that, are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Somebody say amen. Listen church, you need and I need to drink from the water that comes from not just the well, but from the living water. Why would Jesus ask this woman to give him to drink, and yet he created the fountains of the earth, he created the waterfalls of the earth, he created the oceans and the rivers, every drop of water that's locked up in the Atlantic is, is all made by him, yet he says to this woman, give me to drink. You see, there was a terrible problem that we have here. The Samaritans were half Jews. You see, when the Samaritans, or when the Jews rather, went into the northern kingdom, what happened was they intermarried with the tribes there, and the Samaritans were born of these intermarriages. And what happens was that the Jews discarded them. They said, you are not part of us. You are not our race. You are not our culture. You are half-breeds. You have nothing to do with us. Let me tell you something that the blood of Jesus flows through every single human being on planet earth, no matter what your creed, no matter what your culture, no matter which country you come from, no matter what your color, we are all washed and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no color, there is no creed, there is no culture. We are all one culture, the human race, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no racism in the church. There should never be. But here we have racism at its height. Here we have the Jews who knew the scripture. They knew the Torah. They're saying, when well, I have nothing to do with you. We don't want to talk to you. Do you know that the Jews would even pass Samaria, not wanting to go through Samaria if they wanted to go to Galilee because they don't want to associate with the Samaritans. They would go past Samaria. And I had the opportunity of looking at Jacob's well. And Jacob's well is in the area that is in the Samaritan area. In other words, the Palestinians have it in their sight. It owned by them. You can't go there. And when you look up from the well, you see Mount Gerizim. And I can imagine this woman at the well standing there and she says to Jesus, our fathers worshipped at the mountain, that's Jerusalem. They all prayed there. You see, she tried to divert the attention of Christ away from her. But you know, I love Jesus because Jesus reaches out for the outcast, the downcast, the downtrodden. Jesus reaches out to the ones that are broken and hurting and are pained. You see, he deliberately goes through Samaria. Once the disciples are gone, he sits there at the well. And this woman comes at the midday hour. She had no friends because nobody would come with her. Nobody would associate with her. She's too evil. She's an outcast. You don't associate with an outcast. Don't you ever come with this Samaritan woman. The whole city knows she's had five husbands. And she's never found peace with one of them. Five husbands. We could all say it's her fault, but we don't know the story. And Jesus says to her, the one that you are living with is not your husband. And she says, how do you know all of these things? You must be a prophet. You see, she sought peace with every man that came along her way. She sought the comfort from whichever source she could get. 
the man she's living with right now, she does not want to marry. She's had the experience five times and she doesn't want another experience. No woman wants to walk to the well with her. Can you imagine how she shuffles along with her head down, broken, bent, trodden down by society? The whole of, 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 of uh, Shika, Shechem, all of them knew her story. They all knew she had five husbands. They all knew she was an adulteress. Oh, we can't associate with her. She's an adulteress. She is an outcast. We cannot even go to the well with her. Let her go alone. If a wild animal gets at her, all the better. It's a curse that she must carry. But for Jesus. But for Jesus. He makes a deliberate attempt to go through Samaria. And he sits at the well there. And this woman comes with a bucket or whatever utensil or whatever vessel she brought in to draw water. And she was there and I could understand her head was down and low, broken and bent. Her husband would have just had her there. Maybe she cooked for him and cleaned for him and that or, or this man that she was living with. And therefore that kept him and kept her together. She thought about her five husbands and she said, I must really be bad. I must really be rotten. I must really be so bad that nobody wants to even walk with me anymore. Are you in that situation today where everybody has written you off? Where everybody has said to you, you've done this and you've done that. Your life is a mess. When I look at your past life, there's nothing good that I could re report about your life. But there's a man sitting at the well. There's a man waiting for you at the well. His name is Jesus. May I tell you that the longest conversation recorded in the Bible is the conversation between the woman of Samaria and Jesus. There is no other longer converse conversation than the one with Jesus and the woman. Nobody else speaks as much as Jesus does to her and she to him, not even John, the beloved disciple. And yes, she is there. And he says, give me to drink. She says, you have nothing to draw. How can you give me living water? I cannot give you water. You are a Jew. I am a Samaritan. I don't even think she would have picked her eyes up and looked into his face because you're not allowed to look at the face of a Jewish man. She stood there broken, bleeding emotionally. Not understanding. And as he stood there, I just think Jesus thought of the scriptures in Numbers. So clearly where it says that if a woman is caught in adultery, the book of Numbers, if a woman is caught in adultery, this is what you do. You see, Jesus is so brilliant and so clever at everything he does. He comes to this woman and he's replaying something that the Old Testament demanded. What was it? Numbers chapter 5 verses 11 to 31. I would rather tell you the story. Numbers chapter 5 verses 11 to 31. Now remember we're talking about the book of Numbers and we're talking about the New Testament in the book of John. You got that? Now in Numbers, what does happen here with the Levitical law. The Levitical law says this. The Levitical law says, if a woman is caught in adultery, if a husband suspects that his wife is having an affair, then he is to bring an ephod of flour and give it to his wife. And she is to bring it to the temple. Please follow with me. If you remember nothing else about this message, remember this. And as she comes into the temple, the high priest takes holy water and then he takes sand, dust from the temple floor. He puts it into the water. He shakes it up and that water becomes bitter. And then the high priest says, you are to drink of this bitter water. And she has to say after him, that if I am found to be guilty and I drink this water, a curse must come upon me. I must be barren and not bear children. But if there's 
No curse on me. I will conceive and bear children. You got it? And so what happens with the woman is the high priest takes the water. He puts the dust into the water. He stirs it and he says to the woman who's caught in adultery, drink. And she drinks of it. And if she is found with fault, there's a curse that comes upon her. Jesus sits at the well and he says, woman, you give me to drink. Isn't that beautiful? He says, woman, you give me to drink. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is sitting there and he's saying to you, all your curses, all your sins, all your discouragement, all your rejection, all your hurt, all your pain, give me to drink and I will drink it all. Hallelujah. I will drink your curse. That's what he really says to the woman at the well. He says to her, woman, give me to drink pain. Give me your down. Your being an outcast. Give me your pain. Give me your hurt. Give it to me, woman. Give me to drink. And on the cross, he says, I thirst. Hallelujah. He says, I thirst. They come with a sponge of vinegar and they put it to his mouth and they say, drink. He says, I thirst. You see on that cross, on that cross, go from numbers to the well, to the cross. What does he do? He drinks your pain. He drinks your curse. He drinks your discouragement. What a master we serve. What a God we serve. Woman, give me your pain. Give me the hurt of your five husbands. Give me the pain of rejection. Nobody wants to come to you, woman, because you're full of sin. Listen, church, don't ever judge a sinner because we're all sinners. The Bible says we are all unrighteous. And we are all desperate for forgiveness and salvation. The church should never be a place where we judge each other. The church should never be a place where we look at each other with disgust. The church should be a place of love. The church should be a place of compassion. The church should be a place where we would sit on the well and wait for the Samaritan woman. Jesus did that. He sat and he waited until she came and when she came he says give me to drink and to this morning i want to say to you living waters give him to drink like in the book of numbers the high priest would come and stir the water the holy water and give her to drink here we have the dirt of this world and jesus says give me to drink and i will drink your curse i will drink your pain I will drink your disillusionment. I will drink your discouragement. I don't know what pain you may have gone through. I don't know what hurt you're going through right now. Some of you are sitting there. You're broken to pieces. You are only holding back your tears because you're in the midst of other people. Left alone, you would rather be in a room bawling your eyes out and saying, Lord, how much longer? How much longer should I endure this pain? I've got news for you. There's a man sitting at the well. His name is Jesus and he says to you give it to me I'll drink it all give it to me you don't have to drink anymore that woman in the book of numbers oh no you don't have to suffer the curse anymore because upon the cross of Calvary the curse was broken once and for all somebody say amen and give the Lord some praise you know if ever my heart goes out it goes out to a Christian who's struggling to live a godly life. Because let me tell you, it's not easy. It's not easy. People place us on a pedestal and more so a pastor. You must live a righteous life. You must live a holy life. You ever, ever noticed how when you do something wrong at work or in your circular environment, they'll come to you and say, but you're supposed to be a Christian. They set those standards for us. But only you and I know how hard it is to live a life that's pleasing to God. It's very hard. But that's why the Bible says in Philippians 2, 7. But he made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. 
Jesus was hungry like you and I. Jesus was thirsty like you and I. Jesus was cursed like you and I. Jesus was rejected like you and I. But he took all of that because he could say to you and I this morning, give me to drink. What have you got in your cup that's bitter? Give it to him. He's willing to drink it. Tell me, is there anybody in the world that will say to you, give me your bitter cup and I'll drink it? Buddha will never be able to do that for you. They'll teach some wonderful teachings and wonderful sayings, but he'll never drink your Buddha cup, your, your bitter cup. Muhammad will never drink your bitter cup. Krishna will never drink your bitter cup. But I tell you what, there's a man that says, give it to me, I'll drink it. Hallelujah. Give it to me, I'll drink it. There's only one man in all of history, only one man in all of human, humanity that says, give me that bitter drink, I'll drink it for you. And I want to present to you that man, his name is Jesus. He loves you so much, you'd never understand how much he loves you. May I tell you that he loves you more than you would ever believe or understand. That he would go through Samaria, intentionally go through Samaria to meet the one woman. What happened to this woman who went back to the town that she was discarded, downtrodden, outcast? She goes back to that same place, that same town, and suddenly the whole town hears her. How come? Nobody listens to a woman in those days. Leave alone an adulteress. Nobody listens to this Samaritan woman that had five husbands, nobody listens to her, but she goes back, she leaves the pot there, she goes back without the water, and she goes back into the city, and she tells everybody, there is a man, hallelujah, oh church, there is a man, he told me everything I ever did, I love Reynard Bonka, I love Reynard Bonka, he says, the day the church stops giving coffee and cake and substituting that for the Holy Spirit, that's the day the church will start to grow. Too many churches, he says, substitute the Holy Spirit with coffee and cake. Here is a woman that leaves the pot and she goes back to Samaria. Shechem and she tells everybody, there's a man, hallelujah. He told me everything. And you know what? They listened to her. How come? Why did they listen to her now? There was a change. When you meet the man that can give you living water, everything about you changes. Nothing remains the same. When you meet this man whose name is Jesus, who's sitting at the well, who's waiting for you, I tell you what, you don't even have to say anything. All you have to do is say to the people, there is a man. And what did this man do? He said, give me to drink. What did he do? He took my bitter cup and he drank it all. He drank my bitter cup. And she says, he told me everything. You see, the church needs to come back to the days of signs and miracles. When we come back to signs and miracles, the people will listen. We need to see healing. We need to see deliverance. We need to see lives change. We need the greatest miracle of all. If you see a sinner at the altar, bawling their eyes out and saying, I repent, Lord Jesus Christ. We need to see more of that. We need to see a change. This woman's testimony was so powerful that everybody listened. And you know what? Jesus stayed there two more days. <laughs> and you know what? The Samaritans gave their hearts to Jesus by the hundreds. Listen, let me tell you something. That there's no caste, there's no creed, there's no male, there's no female, there's no nothing with Jesus Christ. We are all equal and we are all the same. Hallelujah. He loves every one of you equally and he would do for you what he would do for everybody else. You are special. You are created in the image and in the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've suffered a lot in this country through apartheid and everything else that went on. We've suffered a lot. But can I tell you something? That this country is one of the most powerful countries in the whole of the world when it comes to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have ministries in South Africa that would have never been birthed 
except we come out of the pain and the torment that we've come out of. And we can thank the Lord. I want to ask you, are you willing to go to Samaria? Are you willing to go to Shechem and tell them there's a man? There's a man that told me everything about myself. He said, give me to drink. There's a wonderful song I'd like to play for you. Thank you, Clinton. And I'd like you to stand and take this in. I want you to be blessed by this music. Blessed by the lyrics. If you're ready, can you play it for me, please? Lights. Something beautiful. Something good. All my confusion. He understood. All I had to offer him was broken. But he made something beautiful of my life. If there ever were dreams that were lofty and noble, they were my dreams at the start. And hopes for life's best were the hopes that I harbored. Down deep in my heart But my dreams turn to ashes And my castles all crumble My fortune turned to loss So I wrapped it all In the rags of my life And laid it at the cross so again. God can make something beautiful out of your brokenness. He can take your brokenness and your strife and he can do something beautiful this morning. Oh, all I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something of my life Yes, he made something beautiful of my life Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jed. You may take your seats, church. I think that song sums it all up. He can make something beautiful of your life. You know, when you look at Shechem, you find that the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, and Dinah were here. And what happened was, the sons of Hamor, H-A-M-O-R, raped Dina or Dinah, which was Jacob's daughter. And what happened was, Simeon and Levi, Father Jacob said, leave them alone. But you know what Simeon and Levi did? They went and killed every single man from Sheka. Everyone. And they took over the city. And I want to say to you, this place was a place of rape. This place was a place of murder, Sheka or Shechem. A place of rape, a place of bloodshed, a place of murder. But Jesus comes to this place and he says, give me to drink. 
And he says, the water that you give me will not satisfy my thirst. I will give you living water. What is the answer? No matter how bad the place you are in, no matter how much of murder and rape there was there, no matter how much of immorality and distrust there was there, when the man comes into that place, everything changes. Everything changes. This morning I want to present to you something. Jesus can make something beautiful out of your broken life. Jesus can make something out of your broken life. He says, give me to drink. I challenge you. Find somebody in history that would say, give me your bitter cup. There's something also that I'd like to tell you. The man Nicodemus was esteemed, well known. He was of high repute. He chose to come to Jesus at night, quietly. Jesus speaks to him and talks to him about the wind. Nicodemus gives his heart to Jesus. How must I be born again? Must I enter into my mother's womb? And you know the story so well, but here we have the Samaritan woman. And you see the progression from here with this man of very high repute. Now we have this woman of very low repute. You see, Jesus is available no matter who you are in society. You can be a high-ranking official in the department. You can be a low-ranking official in the municipality. But Jesus still has time for you. This woman, at the midday hour, when everybody could see, Jesus meets her. This man, when nobody could see, Jesus meets him. No matter what the day, no matter what the hour, no matter who you are, no matter how bad you may think you are, there is a man. His name is Jesus. And he's sitting and he's waiting for you. I don't know why we love to put people down. We as human beings, myself included, we like to put people down. We like to tramp them when they're down. But there's a man whose name is Jesus who tramps nobody. <laughs> he lifts everybody up. We have in our presence Petra. She walked in. Petra will tell you that she works in the middle of town. She works amongst the downtrodden. Am I right, Petra? She works amongst those that are prostitutes, that are prostitutes, drug addicts. She works amongst the foreigners. I ask her, Petra, how do you, a lady from the United States of America, come to Durban, South Africa, stay in the midst of town? How do you survive? But the Lord has kept her. The Lord has kept her. We've been with her for many years, and I can tell you what. She has a thing also, you know. She first will give them all a wonderful sermon about Jesus. She'll have the food smell there all the time. But she'll be telling them about Jesus. You cannot eat if you don't listen to the message. <laughs> you cannot eat until you listen to the message. She's got a home also for children. For children that have children. She's got a home for them. And her heart so full of compassion for those that are hurting those that are pain, pained, and I'm talking about that very thing this morning. Where you have Jesus going there for the downtrodden. Jesus not going to the Nicodemuses. Actually, Nicodemus came to him, but he came to the Samaritan woman. He waited at the well for her. And I want to tell you, if you are that person, Jesus is looking for you. Jesus is coming after you. You may be a person of high repute, and you may go after Jesus, but if you have low repute, you're in a better position right now. Jesus is coming to you. Hallelujah. He's on his way. He's on his way. He's sitting on the wall and he's waiting. You see, unfortunately, we do not give people a chance. And as a pastor, I want to tell you, everybody deserves a chance. Everybody deserves a chance. Somebody say amen and say, that's me. There's an exchange taking place here. Jesus said, if you give me a cup of water, I will give you a fountain that will never run dry. Hallelujah. Give me your cup. Give me your hurt. Give me your pain. Give me your curse and I will give you a fountain that will never run dry. Somebody say, hallelujah. There's an exchange going on. What are you exchanging? When you give God some praise in the church, 
when you give some God some praise on the road, when you give God some praise in your home, when you give God some praise at your workplace, you give him that cup. Listen, he will give you a fountain. Hallelujah. When you give Jesus that amount of worship, he will open heaven's windows and pour upon you a blessing that you cannot contain. You need to worship God. You need to praise him. You need to just give him everything, your bitter cup, and he will give you a beautiful cup. Isaiah 61 verse 3, to point un to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes. Hallelujah. You know what Jesus gave the woman at the well? He gave her beauty for ashes. Say to your neighbor, beauty for ashes. No, you've got to say it like you mean it, beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. Say it. Lord, please let them have breakfast. <laughs> you know, while I was doing this uh, message, I thought about something. This man was dying. He was on his deathbed. And his wife was there and poor guy John is dying. And he had a friend, his friend's name was Sam. They were very, very good friends for a while. And then they became very, very nasty to each other. Terrible. Very bad. The relationship was terrible. They wanted to kill each other. And as this man lay on the bed dying, his wife was there and stroking him for the last few moments. And then he said to his wife, I want you to marry Sam, bad guy. She said, what? I must marry your worst enemy, Sam. You're dying. And you want me to marry your worst enemy? He said, yes. I suffered with you this 40 years. Let him suffer now. <laughs> I know when to wake you up. Listen, I don't know about you, but I'm in that category of brokenness. I'm in that category where I want beauty for ashes. Not one of us can say, I've arrived. <laughs> Not one of us can say, I don't need to mourn because I have the oil. <laughs> you don't. You and I don't. We are constantly seeking for that peace. Am I right or wrong? We are constantly seeking we go from Mr. Price to Woolworths to Hub to Ackermans to get that outfit because we are never pleased. We go from beautician to beautician to beautician, but none of the beauticians are like Jesus that can perform miracles. <laughs> we are never ever satisfied. We go from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant, never satisfied. We go from church to church to church, never satisfied. You know why? When you meet the man at the well, he will give you living water. And when you have that willing, living water, you'll never want again. You'll never thirst again. He says, give it to me. I'll drink it. I'll drink it all. You know, I love Jesus so much this morning because there's nobody ever said to me, give me your hurt and I'll drink it. Give me your pain and I'll drink it. Give me all your discouragements and I'll drink it. Give me whatever and I will drink it. You know, people talk about racism, even in the Indian community amongst themselves. The greatest racism in amongst the Indians themselves, you know, in the caste system in India. They will ask you, what, what language do you speak? And I heard this week, somebody say, if he's a Tamil-speaking boy, I don't want him for my daughter. Can you believe it? If he's a Tamil-speaking boy, I don't want him for my daughter. If he's a Hindi-speaking boy, you mustn't marry a Singh. What nonsense is all of this? But Jesus cuts right through. And he says, listen, I don't care who you are, what you are. I'm waiting for you at the well. I love him. I love him. I love him. Because with Jesus, he doesn't even care about how sinful you are. He doesn't care about who you are. All he wants is to love you. Is there any man that would say to you, listen, all I want is to love you. <laughs> I got nothing else that I want from you. All I want is to love you. Somebody might say, but you know what? 
Jesus loves to be worshipped. He loves to be reverenced. Who is he? May I tell you he's the son of God. May I tell you that he's the son of God. Yes, beauty for ashes. Now say it after that joke. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Jeremiah 2.5 Your ancestors turned from me and worshipped worthless idols. The things that you worship, you will become like it, the book of Jeremiah says. All the things that you worship, you will become like it. The more you see Jesus, the more you will become like him. Hallelujah. The more you spend time with Jesus, the more you will be like him. Moses went up onto the mountain. When he came down Mount Sinai, his face shone. He had to put a veil because he was with Jesus. He was with God. The glory of God radiated from him. When you spend time with Jesus, the glory of God will radiate from you. Somebody say amen. Spend time with the master. Give me to drink. Give me to drink. He wants to take everything. The woman at the well was an adulterer. I'm closing. Jesus said to her, go and fetch your husband. You see, Jesus said, go and fetch. And she says, he said to her, that's not your husband. You're living with him. You see, the high priest should have taken the water and made it bitter and forced her to drink. But what did Jesus do? He said, I will give you living water. Jesus wants to do the same for you today. He wants to give you living water. You see, today I leave you with this. No matter how bad you consider yourself, no matter how downtrodden and outcast you are, there's a man who's sitting at the well. Won't you please stand? Can I have the musicians up? Um, we want to sing that song. Sydney, you know that song, Something Beautiful, Something Good. Maybe we can. Bev, come, let's see. I want to sing that song as we close. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. And he made something beautiful of my life. Isn't that a beautiful song? Every eye closed, every head bowed, nobody moving around. Is there anybody that wants to give their hearts to Jesus? You want to give your life to Jesus? You're welcome to come to the front and say, that's me. I need this man that's sitting at the well. Okay, we're going to try that. Go eat. Something beautiful Yeah.
of your people, especially those that are hurting, especially those that the world has discarded as useless, especially those that the world has said you belong in a rubbish heap, especially those that have been emotionally hurt, financially stripped. Father, I bring them all to you. I bring everyone that is under the sound of my voice to you and I say, Father God, including myself, give me that fountain that will never run dry. Help me to drink from that fountain that will never run dry. Thank you for going onto that cross and saying I thirst and drinking all of it. Father, we bless your name. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. I pray that every person here today, Lord, will will find such great success in 2020. I pray that there will be promotions. I pray that there will be jobs like never before. I pray that people will be blessed abundantly. I pray, God, that every business that's floundering shall prosper. I pray that you will make them the head and not the tail. I pray, God, for favor. I pray for protection. I pray that you would embrace them with your arms of love. I pray for peace. I pray for joy. I pray for happiness that the people of this church shall be blessed. Hallelujah. <laughs> Won't you receive the benediction? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee 